All right, made some really good progress on this AC15 project. And I've got the board, I'd say 96% finalized, um, by which I mean uh, any further changes or just minor tweaks in placement. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to use the existing um, mounting locations on the chassis. I tried that, but it would move everything to the right and too close to the jacks and make it difficult to wire a switch, etc., etc. So it's I've got the placement of the board now. Everything on the chassis is accurate to within about a thousandth of an inch, including the power transformer cut out here. And I know where all the jacks are going to go and where all the pots are going to go. So I'm very happy about this. Here is a circuit which emulates the smoothing, the compression, and the voltage drop of an EZ81 tube rectifier. I would prefer not to use a tube rectifier. Um, I will make that a, an option, I guess, for those who want to keep throwing $20 rectifier tubes uh, in a world that's full of potholes. Uh, there's no advantage. It just causes a lot of heat. One more thing to fail. But for those who don't trust me or don't trust uh, how circuits work, we can give you an easy 81, though I advise against it. On that note, later, as this thing becomes closer to fruition, we'll discuss EF86s in the real world. Um, if you get one of these and you want the EF86 channel, I strongly recommend that you get the head version, not the combo version. And really, EF86s are great for studio, unless you've got a road crew that will absolutely baby things. I don't think it's the most rugged tube to take on the road. Um, we'll get there. And EF86 is kind of a special thing to buy in 2021. You've got to know what you're getting into. And like I said in an earlier video, video later, I'm going to look at some uh, MOSFET equivalents. Um, I know that no one will believe me uh, until they hear it, but it can be emulated very, very well without all the downsides of microphonics and, and damage. But we'll get to all, all that later. So I've got a layout that's going to work, and I've got a board that's going to work. And because people ask it, keep asking, uh, I'm in Corel Draw 19 here. Uh, this is my 2D CAD program. Uh, Illustrator does the same thing. There are other CAD programs. Um, I like Corel Draw because I've used it a long time and I'm really fast and I know all the shortcuts and switching to Illustrator or something else would take me forever. And I don't need the full 3D capabilities of a full-fledged CAD program. Though I think this program actually now does offer some 3D stuff, which I have not explored just because I don't need to. I work well in two dimensions. The board layout, however, was done with a program called DIY Layout Creator, and that's freeware. And if you Google uh, DIY uh, Layout Creator, uh, you'll find it. And it's a good program. It's accurate with it about, oh, four or five thousandth of an inch. And you don't have great control over everything, uh, but you have control over enough things that you can pretty much know what you're going to get. For instance, these radial caps mounted on their side are not uh, an actual component within the program. They're just black rectangles of approximately the correct, correct size with a, a gray stripe added so that I can see I remember which side is ground. All the other components are from their libraries, and you're able to specify the length and the width and the color and the value and all that fun stuff. But those are the two programs that I use for this. I use other programs. I use Express PCB for schematics, and uh, uh, the boards that I need to have made are in such small numbers that the Express PCB is great. I think they're doing Gerber now, which is a cool thing. Um, I used to have a, a copy of Eagle, but it uh, stopped working. And I haven't had the money to re-up Eagle. I can only keep so many subscriptions going. And I don't do a lot of PCB stuff now. So Express PCB, PCB for that. And I use LT Spice. And uh, when I'm doing load lines, I use data sheets and a ruler and uh, a number two pencil. Let me get to the next fun bit of this design process. All right. I mentioned that I transfer the act actual holes... Uh, the placement and the size in the existing chassis 
into the computer, and this is a representation of those holes. So this is the uh, uh, combo here up top, and this is the head, so just 180. Um, but then I wanted different things on different versions of the app. So the simpler version would use mostly existing holes, a couple of new holes added for switches, and then some changed holes here. So the old holes would be behind the metal panel and new holes here. But on the more complicated version, say the one with the EF86 and the top boost, I would only be using three of the existing holes. All the other holes would be covered and new holes would have to be drilled. And that gets complicated uh, in terms of the labor involved. The other issue is uh, consistency. So here's the simpler version with a, say an EF86 channel and the uh, normal channel and just a cut and a master volume. But here'd be the full-fledged version with either the normal or EF86 channel and the top boost channel with added mids boost, and uh, this one has variable voltage, but master variable, variable voltage are, are going to take up the same spot depending on which version someone orders. But not only is this really complicated with a lot more holes for me to drill, these don't look like the same app. If you're looking at these two apps from across the room, you don't say, oh, that's, that's the two variations of that app that that guy uh, in Memphis makes. You look at that and see two different amps. So I wanted something uh, that would draw them together visually and make it one app with variations. Reduce the amount of labor because that lowers the cost for you guys and reduces the complexity because you look at this and it's, you know, you got to have labels, what's global, what's, what's what. And I came up with, I think, a great solution. Let me show you what led me to that. On the original... The first versions of the Top Boost amp that Box came out with, the Top Boost circuit was an add-on. It was a little card on the back, and those knobs were stacked vertically. And I thought about that. I thought about the fact that uh, most people, that's almost a set and forget. You know, they're easy to adjust, even vertically. But uh, most people pretty much set those in a particular spot. It's the volume that you're going to want to adjust a lot. So, with that in mind, I came up with this layout. Now here, on the top boost option, I have treble and bass stacked vertically with a slightly smaller knob. Uh, the original had bass up top, treble below. Uh, this made more sense because I wanted a pull shift for the mids boost on the bass pot to save panel space. Um, that will work great. It's a preset uh, boost, but it's one that people really love when they have it. So it's a, a no-brainer to make that base of push-pull. Now the pots behind there will be full-size, good quality pots, even though the knobs are smaller. Now going to the smaller knobs means that I cannot use the chicken heads. You know, the chicken heads are great. Can't fit chicken heads this size because they're too small and they, they clang into each other. And they look kind of dorky when they're that small. Um, so let me show you what I found, which is going to be beautiful. All right, obviously this is a mock-up I made, but these are some aluminum knobs that are not expensive. They're beautiful. This is about the right proportion between them. They're black aluminum with a nice indicator line. Uh, they're a good size. They're going to look professional, and it lets me fit everything on the chassis. So I'm not trying to copy everything that Vox did. I'm trying to do a stylistic nod in that direction while making it a very utilitarian amplifier that looks great and is easy to intuitively operate. So, if we have those black aluminum knobs, um, then the uh, issue is what color do we make the uh, faceplate? Now, I like using aluminum instead of the various acrylics because the acrylic panels are very thick and it's really hard to uh, get everything secure. It's harder to use lock washers but of the aluminums I found, it's really hard to find a good looking red. A lot of them are very fire engine or cartoon red. Um, and I've not found one that's anywhere close to the copper panel. And, uh, you know, making these things really high quality at a reasonable price involves some compromise. 
Fox has those made for them in large quantities. I have to work with what I can get um, that is affordable. So I'm thinking we can do a matte black, we can do a gloss black, or we can do a black anodized aluminum, which is really a dark gray. And I'm leaning towards that because if the panel is a dark uh, gray uh, anodized aluminum that reveals to a, a white, a, a gray that's almost white, and then we have those semi-gloss black aluminum um, knobs, and then the shine coming from the chrome on the uh, on the Neutrik jacks or cliff jacks, and the uh, the switch crap, sorry, sorry, carling switches. Notice the little mute switch. We'll get back to that. This will look visually fantastic and it will be a stylistic nod to most people know the copper panel, the red, that's the one everyone knows and wants. But in 1965, Vox actually changed to this gray panel. And most of the amps in the US after the Ed Sullivan appearance actually have this gray panel and the uh, anodized aluminum should look very similar to that. I don't have a picture of that to show. Trust me. So I'd be picking up on that. Um, on that same subject, notice that they have these kind of curved corner squares dividing everything up. And then over here, they've got a big round voltage selector, a power light, a fuse, and a power switch. Well, I wanted to reference that without directly copying that, especially since I don't want the fuse up there. I don't want to use that style of indicator light and we're not going to have a mains voltage selector up top. But let me show you what I have done. All right, so we have the power switch, an LED indicator, which I've shown is blue, might be red. That's an easy thing. I've got a mute switch here where the original had a fuse holder. The app does not need standby, whether it has the EF80 uh, EZ81 or whether it has the solid state rectification, this amp does not need a standby switch. But it's nice to have a stage mute, so mute if you want. And then a, a uh, logo or amp name about the same size as that old uh, power uh, selector switch, the mains voltage selector switch. So I think this is going to be great. I think this is just going to be called the Sonic Audio 15. And here on the top of the curve, this one says Pentoed T-Boost. That may change. Pentoed Normal, Normal T-Boost. Those may change. These two show voltage here for the variable voltage. This one says Master. I've got the curve uh, uh, sections. I didn't do it exactly the way they did. I thought this looked nicer given the space I had to work in. Um, you know, the tight switch on the EF86 channel is as this on the ones that say Pinto. That's the same thing that uh, JMI had as a rotary switch, a two position switch with control with the pot. So that is actual JMI circuit. A similar thing is done on the normal channel, which basically turns uh, that from the uh, normal input of a non top boost AC30 normal from say 62 to the brilliant input of a non-top boost AC36 from 1962. Um, so you have the ability, if you have the one with the normal and the top boost, to get the uh, normal channel everyone knows, but also the brilliant input of a non-top boost AC30 from that era. That's a nice feature and it's uh, consistent. So it's easy to see that, hey, this is all the stuff for this channel. This is all the stuff for that channel. This is all the global stuff and this is just turning it on and off or muting it and knowing if it's on or off with a stylistic nod to the original without uh, directly putting a big old voltage selector there. And um, this reuses almost all of the existing holes. So there's very little extra drilling I have to do for any of this, which lowers the cost, which is always nice. Now that I'm looking at this, I think that the mute and uh, power light need to go to the right just a hair to balance everything out. And I've got to go through here and adjust the spacing of letters so I don't have any trap space or weird weird uh, things like uh, G is too close to the L. Uh, most people don't care, but I care, and my wife teaches graphic design for I a living. Care. 
hello. And if I don't fix all this stuff before it goes out into the world, she will kill me. So that's where we're at on this. And I think it's going to be really nice. So I'm going to get rid of some of the old versions here. But I am going to do the uh, black on white versions of these because it's faster to work with without rendering all the stuff. But as mock-ups go, I think these are pretty nice.